Okay, uh, so I apologize to anyone who watches uh, my YouTube videos in advance. There's gonna be a little bit of overlap. We're gonna get a lot more granular than I do in the videos um, in this presentation. Uh, we're gonna get to you know a little bit more detail. Um, and uh, I won't waste too much time on who we are, what we do, but just to give you guys a little bit of context, uh, I own Precondo. We are a uh, pre-construction sales team in Toronto. We're one of the largest, certainly the fastest growing websites in the space. Um, the difference between us and someone like BuzzBuzz or, or Condo Now, the only two websites that are larger than us, is the fact that obviously we can sell you units. So if you register on Condo Now or BuzzBuzz, your information is then sold to a third party agent who hopefully has platinum status and, and can sell you a unit. We obviously do all of that in-house. We have in-house property managers, um, a great in-house legal team, saves our clients thousands of dollars on closing costs and, uh, and all the rest of it. So without further ado, let's get into the meat of this. So um, first thing I wanna talk about is obviously the elephant in the room, uh, how COVID has impacted the Toronto condo market. And then we'll get into how it's impacted the market as a whole. So obviously, when COVID first came into play, we saw a massive surge in condo listings. So this chart here is from Scott Ingram on Twitter. He does great weekly tracking on active listings. And you can kind of see that while freeholds remain relatively constant in terms of listing volume and in terms of how many markets were, units were on the market, condos absolutely surged. And a lot of that can be attributed to the fact that, um, you know, when low paying jobs are cut, that stress starts to move up market when people can't pay their rent. And of course, obviously, anybody who had Airbnb units, a lot of those people are highly levered and you know ran for the door. Um, and you can kind of see that here. So this is a great chart from this is a great chart from Urban Nation here about the change in resale price per square foot. This was last year. So third quarter of 2020 versus first quarter of 2020. Um, and you can see here that. Uh, boutique buildings that are you know 20 stories and less actually didn't see any price regression meanwhile anything 20 20 stories and above did uh, and you can extrapolate I mean, you can extrapolate a lot of different meaning from this um, but the way i like to look at it is it's it's not just that high rises saw the brunt of the the brunt of the price regression it's also that uh, it's also an issue of, of type of ownership right so um, in those high rise buildings, especially in the downtown core, those 40 story plus buildings, a lot of those are newer buildings with smaller units. Um, and you have a higher ownership percentage of investors rather than end users. And when you look at boutique buildings, uh, if you live in a boutique, you probably know this boutiques often have more end users. So people who actually own the unit and live in the unit that they own, um, and less investors, so you have less sort of rental supply in that market. Um, and this just goes to show, this just kind of drives the point home. This is why you are seeing, you know, high rise buildings with far, far more price regression than, than the low rise inventory. Um, and we saw this across a number of different um, types of assets too. So for example, like hard lofts didn't depreciate last year. Like if you had a unit at Toy Factory or Candy Factory, like you were good. Um, in fact, um, someone on our team, Riley, actually, you know, he paid like 1300 a foot to get a unit at Toy Factory. Um, and this was in the middle of COVID in the middle of the summer. Um, and it just goes to show like uh, unique inventory, larger inventory and sort of more boutique or inventory owned buildings that were more owned by and users fared really well. And so it's kind of important to remember that. Um, so rental rates, depending on who you ask and depending on which study you look at uh, are down anywhere from five to 20%. And, and just like sales numbers, it's very um, asset specific. And, and when you're talking about the condo market, you're talking about asset specificity, you're talking about building specific. So there are some buildings that didn't really see any, any harm to the rental rate, like some boutiques in the junction barely saw any regression in rental rates. And then there were some that saw massive regression in the rental rate, 15, 20%. Some examples of the buildings that saw the worst regression in the rental rate would be like ICE condos because of the high concentration of Airbnbs. Um, you know, buildings that are recently completed uh, near Ryerson because of the lack of foreign students and lack of students in general that would normally eat up all that rental supply easily. And so those rents were kind of a, a race to the bottom. And again, highly concentrated in buildings where there was, you know, more, uh, less end users and more units owned um, by investors. 
Um, but it's important to remember that when you reduce mortgage rate by 1%, you offset a significant chunk and a significant chunk of rental decrease. So these are just some sample numbers here. You have 2019. Uh, we're assuming the same. This is based on a unit in the junction uh, called Scoop that recently completed. So assuming the price didn't change 20% down, um, just making this one change here. So your interest rate on your mortgage going from 2.7 down to 1.7. So your mortgage decreases by about 200 bucks a month. Your maintenance fees and your taxes, of course, stay constant. So it costs you about $200 a month less to own this as an investor under the new uh, circumstances. But your rental rate went down 15%. So your cash flow changed. So you're looking at a $300 per month difference in your rental rate. Um, so your cash flow, instead of being negative 145, and, we'll, and this is, by the way, a lot of people freak out when they see negative cash flow. Welcome to a blue chip market. This is normal. Go to Manhattan, go to, go to any big major metro. This is normal. Uh, we'll get a, a little bit into that uh, later in this. So your cash flow decreases from 100, negative 145 a month to negative 100, uh, 244. But your principal pay down, because it's important to remember, interest rates not just a function of your monthly gross payment, but it changes how much of your payment actually goes to your principal. So your principal recapture in just year one, and of course this increases each year that goes by, is 10,320 on this unit under the new mortgage rates, and it would have been only 8,800 under the previous mortgage rates. So when you actually adjust for principal recapture, you're better off assuming you can float, assuming you can bleed $244 a month, which you know most condo investors can. Assuming you can afford that, you're actually better off with the lower rate and the lower rent. And of course, the question we got to ask ourselves is, is are rents going to rebound quicker than mortgage rates? I think the answer is yes. We'll get into the reasons as to why a little bit later. So where is the market now? Um, Here's the median annual change for a couple different types of housing, a couple different asset classes across uh, across the GTA uh, year over year. So obviously at the bottom, we've got Toronto condos down 2%. This is an average, this is a median price multiple. Like I said earlier, highly segregated. There are condo buildings that saw appreciation and there are some that did a lot worse than 2% down. Um, but again, just, just for generality, just for median, median numbers here, we've got a 2% decline. Whitby detached up 40.5% in a single year. Burlington detached 39%. Um, what's really interesting to me is the, the city of Toronto detaches up 22.6% year over year. Why that particular number is interesting to me is because of the average price of a detached in Toronto. Um, you can't even get a 50 foot lot in Alderwood for 1.2 million with a teardown home anymore, which is incredibly, sorry, one sec, which is incredibly interesting. Um, so, I mean, it, it's important to like, like, it's important to look at this chart. A lot of people look at this chart and condo investors will see fear. And this is just, you know, investor psychology. People always say they want to buy the bottom, but when there actually is an opportunity in the market, what you find more often than not is people panic and they FOMO into the top of something. For example, buying a Whitby detach right now would feel an off, awful lot to me like buying at the top. Um, so I see this chart and I see opportunity. Assuming we can get back, you know, vaccination rates up, people start getting called back into the office. This chart can change very, very quickly. Um, so moving on to the next chart here, the next graph, sorry. So uh, buyers are flooding back into the condo market. We felt this, I can tell you, I don't like using anecdote, but I mean, we have you know, eight agents on our team. We're all high producers. So we're out every single day with clients. Um, the market went from, you know, first and second week of January listings that had sat over the holidays, not getting any offers and getting a couple showings a week to all of a sudden getting, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 showings in a week uh, and selling in multiple offer scenarios. And these are condos that were literally just sit stale inventories, just sitting on the market. Um, so January of this year was up 85% over January of 2020, uh, which is just an immense amount of sales volume. Uh, and this is specific to condos. So this is not freehold leading into the statistics. This is just condos. It's the highest January for condo sales um, ever was this January. Um, and so a lot of that, and that's why, you know, we go back to one sec here. We go back to this chart here and you can see it right here. All of this inventory is just absorbing incredibly quickly. Okay. Uh, months of inventory is my favorite indicator in the condo market. I'll, I'll, well, sorry, any housing market. 
it kind of tells you where the price is going to go um, it, with almost with relative certainty. And uh, it's like a leading indicator. It gives you like a week or two leeway. And where you, where you see that trending is indicative of where prices are going to trend next. So anything below three months of inventory is a seller's market. Anything between four, five, six months of inventory is a balanced market. Anything above seven months of inventory is a buyer's market. So how you calculate this is if you have a thousand listings on the market, you have 500 sales in one month, thousand divided by 500, you have two months of inventory. So we are down to uh, 1.1 months of inventory in the condo market. Um, if you can like, this right here was the dip. People always say they want to buy the dip. This was the dip. You can see it October, November, December, uh, clear as day here. Um, and like I said, as we got into January and February, we started seeing multiple offer scenarios on condos, tons of buyers back in the market, condos selling well over ask. And we've officially flipped freehold in terms of um, how strong of a seller's market we're at. It's 1.2 to 1.1. So, I mean, no matter how you slice it, it's incredibly hard to get to get into a condo or, or, or a freehold right now without paying significantly more than ask. Um, but, you know, it's just important to note that when MOI starts to trend down, prices start to trend up. Um, obviously COVID not specific to Toronto, right? This is a worldwide thing. Uh, here's the months of inventory for Miami condos. Miami is becoming a pretty attractive location for a lot of people in the States who are looking for cities to move to. Uh, and you can see that here, months of inventory is dipping. Um, but just to kind of give you a perspective of how hot the Toronto market is, uh, nine months of the, you could say a long-term average here of nine months of inventory for Miami condos. Manhattan, long-term average here, uh, long-term average, 7.4 months of inventory. Recent, um, Average 16 months of inventory. So deep, deep buyer's market. Um, of course, Manhattan seeing uh, outflow of people. And so that's to be expected. Miami is a stronger market, but still, you know, nine, eight to nine months of inventory. So a couple of specific examples. Again, apologize if you watch my YouTube videos. These are, you know, repeats from the market update I just did. Um, but uh, they're, they're great examples. This is one thing to say, you know, months of inventory is turning down, prices are turning up. It's another thing altogether to show specific examples of that happening. So this is one that caught my eye. 50 Wellesley sold for 891. Unit 1604 sold for 891 in January. And then unit 1904, exact same unit with parking. No difference between the two units except three floors of height sold for $139,000 more. Um, next example, we have 16 Young, unit 2701. Sold for 805 and then unit 3901, same thing, exact same unit, exact same floor plan, same square footage with parking. Sold for 900,000, uh, 23, 23 day spread on this. So you're looking at a 12% increase in value. Uh, and, you, and you can see just based on the listing price, right? Like this was listed for 800, sold 805. This was listed for 800, it sold 900. I think same situation here. Yeah, listed 800, sold 1.03 million. Listed 919 and sold for less. So just in, in the span of 30 days, buyers at this building have gone from having the ability to, to negotiate terms to having to go in with a firm offer well over ask. Uh, this is one of my favorite examples because it's, uh, it's near where I live. So 16 Brookers, this one's in Humber Bay Shores. A, unit 805 here, it's a 600 square foot one bedroom with a nice balcony. It's almost the size of a terrace. Uh, it sold for 515, it was listed for 520. This was early January. And then two weeks later, the exact same unit one, uh, two floors above them sold for 577, despite it being listed for 550. This price also means it sold just under a thousand a foot. So it sold for about 970 a foot. Um, resale in Humber Bay is going for 970 a foot. Yet resale on, you can still pick up Queen West resale in five-year-old buildings, similar to Nautilus like this, for 950 a foot. If that's not evidence of a market dislocation to me, then I don't know. Uh, I don't know what is. And I saw someone just ask a question. Um, just want to point this out, guys. I've, at any point in this presentation, something I say or a chart you see kind of spurs a, a question. Throw it in the Q and A, and we're going to come back to it at the end. We're going to answer it at the end. Again, just for showing this chart. Detached strut is up twenty percent, which leads me into my next chart. So this is uh, I'm probably my second favorite indicator. For, con for the condos uh, segment is what the relative affordability is for condos versus, versus detached. 
Sure, there are plenty of people who buy condos to be close to downtown because of the lifestyle. But a big reason why people buy condos in Toronto is also because of affordability. It's a stepping stone to get onto the housing ladder to work your way up to a detached at some point later down the line. Um, so it's, it's important to look at this because people weigh value based on this ratio. So this ratio is the average selling price of a condo versus the average selling price of a detached in the 416 in, in Toronto proper. Historically speaking, the long, long, long-term average is two, meaning that if a condo is going to cost you 500K in that same market, a detached should cost you a million. You can see in 2016, 2015, when the housing market was all about freehold and condo um, condos kind of lagged behind. And then, of course, we had the mortgage stress test, which bit people's affordability, kind of slowed the craze. And then we returned to historical norms for a while here. Um, it, it was incredibly frothy here. Uh, and then it returned back to two. You can see we're running again. We're at 2.4, well above historical norms, meaning that people are looking at condos and they're looking at freehold. And they're making that about they're looking at that value proposition and realizing that once again condos are a really good deal if you look at other major metros similar numbers hold true somewhere between 1.8 and 2.2 is, is sort of normal for condo versus freehold um so this right here is is uh, it's, it's rocket fuel for the condo market assuming the exogenous forces of covid and not working from home and all these different things can go away Condos have a huge runway because detached appreciated 20% and condos didn't appreciate it all. Uh, just another chart driving home the price differential here. So this is from urban Toronto. Just kind of want to focus on this right one here. The last time we had a $600,000 gap in the average price of an average condo versus detached was 2016. And you guys know what happened in 2017. Condos ran, they appreciated like 25, 20 to 30%, depending on where your condo was located. It's the strongest single year for condo appreciation in Toronto uh, ever recorded. And this is the last time MOI flipped. So like I said, months of inventory is a leading indicator, right? When you see detached prices rising, condos are stagnating. And then uh, MOI all of a sudden dips on condos. This isn't new to Toronto. Yeah, COVID's new, but that trend isn't new. The last time that that happened fundamentally in the market was 2016, 2017. Um, different exogenous force being mortgage stress tests instead of COVID. And what resulted was, you know, uh, we were holding steady between three and four months of inventory. The black line here is the months of inventory in the condo market. Okay. Um, holding steady in, in sort of a balanced or, or, or barely seller sided balanced market. And then all of a sudden it dipped below one. What happened? You can see they're almost like inverse graphs of each other. As MOI comes down, price rockets. Uh, and you can see right here, like, that's the year that we saw 30% appreciation in the condo market. I'm not saying we're on track to do the same type of appreciation this year. I, I'm just pointing out that um, this is giving a lot of runway, that extra 20% on, on top of detached prices, a lot of froth. I don't think detached is going to regress. I don't think detached is going to correct. I think it's going to be the opposite. Condos are going to come up and close the gap to the 2x historical model. So the case for Toronto housing as a whole in terms of investing in Toronto. If you look at the HPI, the housing price index, which takes into account different asset classes, different sizes, upgrades, homes, et cetera, um, over the last 20 years, 25 years here, you'll notice that we rolled through the 2008, 2009 uh, financial crisis relative. We saw a little bit of price regression and then headed back up. Um, whereas, you know, other markets in, in North America didn't do so hot. Um, obviously, we have different banking systems in Canada. We don't give zero down mortgages. We don't let people collateralize their stock portfolio. There's, there's a million reasons why uh, we bailed out our banks. There's a lot of reasons why we did better. 2008, uh, people were less levered in terms of the housing market. There's, there's a million reasons. Uh, the argument some people will make when they see this is, well, then Toronto's overvalued because look at all these other major metros in North America and Toronto is obviously leading. So Toronto is pretty frothy. I'll get to that kind of shortly. If you look at... The, the median selling price for a home all across Canada versus the median selling price for a home all across America, 2005 through, through 2019, we saw 127% appreciation, they saw 36. Again, you can look at this chart, extrapolate a lot of different meanings. When you look at this without the context of immigration, you would say, okay, Canada's market's frothy, there's a lot of speculation. Going on. But when you roll immigration into this, right? suddenly the picture changes. So if you, if you annualize 2005 through 2018, 
two, two things, immigration on a yearly basis and housing completions on a yearly basis. You're going to see that they build, they complete far more houses on a yearly basis when compared to their immigration, right? So 287,000 per year on average in Canada versus 187,000 housing completions and the same in the US, uh, 1.175 mil versus 1.175 this um, is that this graph here is Canada as a whole. I like to narrow in to the GTA because we have we get the the lion's share of the immigration, right? Um, it depends on we get as of 2018, 2019, we got 34 um, percent of immigration to Canada, and that's just Toronto. Um, so when you look at this chart, and I know there's a lot here. Let me just kind of break it down. This is two years. What I did was I took all the CMHC housing completion numbers versus our net inflow. So this the net inflow accounts for people moving out of Ontario. It's not just the, immig in, the gross immigration numbers. It's also adjusted for people who have moved out. So let's talk about housing completion. So in 2019 and in 2018, we completed 36,610 condo units, 13,260 semis and, and townhomes, and 15,290 detached. This is across the entire GTA. Toronto, City of Toronto does amazing, um, uh, they do their census, but they also do uh, studies in between their census of persons per dwelling. So essentially how many, based on asset class, how many people on average live in each type of asset? So for co condos, they found that it is two people on average. For semis and, and townhomes, it's 3.06. And for singles, uh, 2.72. So essentially, Across those two years, we built enough housing for 155,000 people, okay, if these numbers, the per person multiples hold up. How many people did we immigrate? What was our net inflow? 252,000. So we're shy uh, housing for 100,000 people in those two years. Um, this is why our market dramatically outperforms a lot of other places in North America. Um, we would have needed to build about 39,000 additional uh, homes, a blend of these in order to meet the demand that we had. So obviously Canada has a new immigration target. Uh, we are targeting 401,000 this year, 411 next, and then 421,000 in 2023. This is up massively from these numbers. Housing supply lags. Detached can be built relatively quickly. Condos take four to six years. Uh, and that's if it's already zoned and ready to sell, right? So. When you have that much exogenous demand, you have that much immigration, it's obviously incredibly inflationary to housing. Remax did a study that showed 30, 29% of immigrants buy within two years of landing here. Um, but it doesn't really matter if they buy or rent, because if they rent, they're eating up rental supply, which is driving up rental rates and cap rates, cash flows, more people invest in properties. Whether they move into a rental unit or a purchase unit, it doesn't matter. It's part of the housing supply, and it's, caused, it's an inflationary pressure, obviously, on the housing market. Um, some people have mentioned, some of the housing bears have mentioned, you know, it's important to note that it might be hard to hit those immigration numbers, right? Un, un, because of COVID, because of uh, high unemployment, it might be difficult to hit those numbers. Not if we keep doing this. So last week was the single largest week we've ever had for express entry invitations issue. It's 27,000. A normal week for us is 5,000, give or take four to 5,000. So if we continue with those numbers, not only will we hit our target of 401,000 um, in terms of immigration, uh, like we'll hit that number with ease. Some people like to talk about um, cap rate. So I want to touch on it because I know it's going to be addressed in the Q&A portion. Obviously, rental rates are down, but prices are for condos stagnant or for detached up. So. So as an investor, a lot of these properties don't cash flow at 20% down. Um, this is true. Uh, a lot of properties don't cash flow with 20% down in Toronto. The vast majority don't. Uh, and they probably never will again. That's just what happens as a city grows in size and, you know, converts from a, you know, Toronto is like a, um, it's, it's, it's a worldwide city, now, right? As we become this blue chip market, we can't expect the cash flows that you get in Hamilton, right? It's just not, it's just not the way it works. It, it's, it's just the natural progression of any major metro that's starting to become more noteworthy on a worldwide scale. And you can see that right here. So on a price per square foot basis, we're still very, very cheap compared to a lot of the other cities of note around the world. Um, but our price to rent ratio is actually 
still quite good. Um, so you're looking at about a four cap, which is by worldwide standards, quite high. Most of them are getting two to three, 3.5 cap at best. And we're still getting almost a four cap. Obviously you can find market dislocations where you can find you know, areas where pre-construction condos or, or just regular condos are selling and, and will cash flow or break even at 20% down. They're rare and few and far between, but if you know how to look, you can find them. Um, but every year the, the pocket of cash flowing units at 20% down uh, decreases and you can expect that trend to continue. Uh, so new condo prices. Obviously, um, if you're on my email list or you watch my YouTube videos, it's no, it's not news to you that uh, pre-construction is expensive. Um, it varies from pocket to pocket because of land costs and development levies. Uh, but pre-construction as a whole is anywhere between 10 and, and 30% more expensive than existing resale units. And when I say existing resale units, I, I mean apples to apples. So like a two or three year old, like a new building, a two or three year old at most building that's in the exact same neighborhood um, generally sells for probably about 20% less. Of course, you've got pockets of downtown where pre-construction is selling for literally 35, 40% more than existing resale. Um, and then you've got areas like Hamilton where you might only be paying a 10% premium and it varies from project to project, but you know, it's, it's just, um, I just want to make a note that, you know, pre-construction does tend to be more expensive than resale. Um, maybe once in a blue moon, we get a project that launches, well, we never really get one that launches below resale, but every once in a while you get one that launches at a decent price and they release some units at a later date. The market has appreciated, um, the resale market has appreciated and you get that kind of gap where suddenly the pre-construction is a better buy, but that's, it's really rare. And, um, uh, I want to talk just for a quick minute here on developer profit margin. Um, now I'm not going to start a GoFundMe for these guys, right? Because seven to 13% profit margin on a four or five, $600 million development is obviously quite good. But the reason why there were so many cancellations in 2018, 4,200 units were canceled in Toronto. Um, and you know, when a pre-construction unit gets canceled, you get your deposits back, you walk away from the deal, Part that sucks to you as an investor is the, the risk is you've missed out on all that appreciation because this asset that you've been holding is no longer an asset. You're just getting your money back, sometimes with penalty interest, oftentimes not. Um, so seven to seven to thirteen percent profit margin. This decreases every year. Um, the reason why projects get canceled is because when materials and cost of construction increase and that margin gets squeezed, they can't get financing. So most ninety nine percent of developers are just like you and I. You know, I don't buy a, a unit with cash. I assume most of you don't. Um, the developer doesn't finance their own construction in 99% of cases. They get a loan from the bank and they have to hit a certain target profit in order to make that happen. Um, the government takes on average $160,000 per unit. It's act, the development levies actually went up in the past uh, in the past year, so that number's not accurate. But anyways, they take a big chunk, about 20% of the cost of a new unit in Toronto is just government charges, development levies, and that kind of thing. Construction costs and land prices continue to rise. So what was most interesting and the, and the indicator I like to watch really closely is what are land values at? So are developers still trading land amongst themselves downtown, developable land at appreciated prices? And if the answer is yes, then the smartest, in my eyes, the smartest people in, in the rooms, the institutional uh, analysts are bullish on real estate and real estate development because they're paying these appreciated land prices which means that they have to sell their, pri their condo projects at a higher price. Uh, and this is why you never see pre-construction launch cheaper. So if you're in a particular pocket and some developer launches at a thousand a foot, it's not like next year, a new developer in the pocket is going to buy land and launch at 950 a foot. It's just not economically feasible. Um, the supply demand crisis of Toronto is really the story that overwhelmingly drives our prices. Like, yes, Low mortgage rates obviously is going to fuel some speculative investment. Um, but the, the big story, the, the reason the last 10 years we've averaged 8% appreciation on condos year over year really is because we just cannot seem to deliver more than 20,000 units a year uh, for condos in Toronto, despite the fact that our population is increasing by 60 to 80,000 a year. 
that's the overwhelming story. I don't see any, any way that that changes, at least in the near to medium term future. Um, in fact, COVID actually made this trend worse. So last year, we were supposed to see a lot more condos launched to market than we did. Um, and what that ultimately means is that those, those units that developers, the thousands, you know, the 10,000 units that were supposed to launch last year that didn't, that got pushed into this year and the following years is supply that's not coming to market in four or five years. Right. So you, you have this opportunity where as an investor, um, you know that the housing supply side situation just got even worse. Like our immigration was low last year. If we can hit our targets this year, which obviously the government intends to with that level of express in, entry invitation, um, there's going to come a time in the near future where we don't see the, the type of completion that we normally do in a year. Um, so I'm not going to get too into the macro stuff. There's great guys on YouTube who cover this stuff. Steve Saratsky is, is a good person to go watch. Um, interest rates are going nowhere for a while. Uh, and I would argue probably longer than this. Um, they may start to creep back up as the economy starts to normalize a bit. Um, but it's unlikely you see any, any material change to interest rates for a long time. Uh, I think it's pretty indicative that rent is going to rebound as soon as immigration picks back up like it already is. And as soon as we see foreign students coming back up. Okay. So like I said, nobody launches cheaper than the last guy. This is uh, all the projects that launched in Etobicoke over uh, 2016 through 2020, um, missing a couple of the newer ones, but you get the point. Um, this is the price per square foot on VIP day one. So they're, you know, pre-public, platinum, whatever you want to call it. The first price list that ever, you know, the first units that ever became available at any of these projects on launch date. This is the average price per square foot for, for, a, for a one bedroom, for your entry one bedroom into any of these projects. As you'll notice, price only goes one way. Um, keeping in mind, of course, resale also appreciated through this. So this is following the market. But if you've been watching pre-construction launches last year, you'll note that this trend continued. So despite the fact that resale prices were down downtown, it's not like downtown pre-construction projects launched cheaper than they did the year prior. Because again, the margins just aren't there. Cost of construction is up, cost of land is up. So inevitably those projects either have to wait it out or they have to launch at those higher prices. Now, what's really interesting to me, and this is what we watch for at Pre-Condo a lot, um, I would say the big differentiating factor between us and a lot of other pre-construction brokers is we don't spam. If you're on our email list, you know, we maybe send one, one email a month at best. And I, we should probably send more than that, but um, we don't send out every, every single project that launches. We're not spamming your email with 20 projects a month, um, trying to tell you everything's the best investments since the last investment. Um, we handpick what we sell very carefully based on um, based on what we think is, a, is really good value to our buyers. Um, 36 Zora launched in October of 2019 at $8.99 per square foot. Resale directly across the street was about $7.50 a foot. So decent value, right? Not that far above market value. What was really interesting was at the time, uh, I, literally exactly a year prior, so in October of 2018, 859 the Queensway, which is right next door to 36 Zora, launched at $700 a foot, so $200 a foot gap. Well, these guys held back some inventory. They held back like 20, 30% of their units, and they launched those units somewhere around here. But they didn't launch them at 900 a foot. They launched them at 775. So when 859 launched, they were right here, right? So the market, the resale market was actually at or more than the price of the, the, the newly released inventory at 859. Yet it took three months to sell that inventory at 859 or give or take. Meanwhile, this project sold out in, in like a weekend time. Uh, it was a really attractive project, great renderings, allowed Airbnb, like a million reasons why investors loved it. But as far as actual value, was it worth more than 859? No, of course not. It's, this, it's the same thing, entry level condos in the Queensway. Um, and so we, we brought a bunch of buyers to 859 and they got in at 125 a foot less than they would have paid at the new launch. Um, they also got to pick what they bought instead of, you know, being forced a worksheet and being forced, uh, you know, you've got 24 hours to sign or I give this to my next buyer. Um, that's kind of the beauty of these under market value opportunities is, is a lot of people aren't watching for them. And so if you're one of the people who are, you can take advantage of that. Um, final note here, this is uh, an awesome rendering. 
of a bunch of future projects that are coming to Toronto. Anything in blue is already under construction. Anything in that, like, pur I guess, purple, you call it, purplish color is um, proposed. Uh, so you've got Sky Tower here. This is one of my favorite projects. Um, it's about 1,400 per square foot. You have Menke's Sugar Wharf, future, launch, future phases here. You've got their current phases that they've nearly sold out of here. Penthouses here, about 1,550 per square foot. Um, you have Tridel's further to the right and to the bottom, you have Tridel's site, Aqua Lina, Aqua Luna, Aqua Bella, and Aqua Vista. Uh, you have Empire Key House down here, way on the east waterfront at 1350, 1400 per square foot. The reason I bring all that the well over here, Tridel's site, um, just off Spadina. So this one's at 13 to 1400 a foot, depending on which unit you're looking at. The reason I bring this up is just to, just to kind of drill the point home. Nothing you see anywhere near this, basically in, in downtown proper, will ever launch below 1400 a foot. It's just not viable economically. It won't happen. Um, so if you can find something that's selling significantly below that in other pockets of the city, um, there's, some, there's some value there. Okay, best pre-construction value project in the GTA. Uh, I know why this is a lot of people came, why a lot of people came here. We'll get back to the market Q and A at the end of this, um, but I just want to run through this quickly. You guys will all get an email with the um, with this, so uh, you don't have to you know take notes or anything. I'll send you an email right after this is done. So some recent and upcoming launches for perspective. So a project launched in Oakville at Dundas and Trafalgar the other week at $900, 950 per square foot. The one bed actually ended up closer, being closer to a thousand a foot. Obviously, you know, Oakville is a big up and comer, lots of condo projects coming to the area. Uh, it sold out with 1400 worksheets. They only had like 400, units, 300 something units. So they sold out two or three times over. Um, parking was included in that. And that was part of the big draw. Um, but of course, uh, you know, that's expensive. Hamilton, um, $800 per square foot. Downtown Toronto, over $1,400 per foot. Big launch coming shortly that you guys all know about. Um, and there's a lot to like about the project, actually. Um, but again, $1,400 a foot. Etobicoke, uh, there's a couple of projects coming well above $1,000 a foot. Um, so moving on to the one I want to talk about, Pinnacle Toronto East. So Shepherd and Warden is not a sexy neighborhood, all right? Uh, but neither is Regent Park, and neither was Regent Park 10 years ago when people invested in it. And a lot of people passed on Regent Park at the time because of the reputation of the neighborhood. Um, and of course, anybody who did invest into that pocket did it incredibly well. Um, the blue, uh, the blue uh, bullet there is Trio at Atria. It's a recently completed building. It's two years old by Tridel. Um, they're right near each other. And we're going to use that as our sort of indicator of as what a new condo in this neighborhood is worth. Okay. Because I, I find a lot of people get, they buy something in Oakville at 900 a foot or whatever, because downtown is 1400. And it's like, it doesn't matter what downtown is. What it matters is don't compare pre-construction to pre-construction. Compare pre-construction to the existing building next door and see if the numbers still make sense. So Trio at Atria, uh, like I said, two years old. It's the last 365 days. You're looking at an average sale price of 652 to uh, 652 per square foot, average rental rate at $3.41 per square foot. Um, just a couple of recent examples. Here's one that sold literally, I think this sold like, yeah, this, this sold um, uh, February 6. Unit 711, uh, it's a, let me move this. it is a two bedroom, two bath with parking. It's 736 square feet. It sold for 650K. Obviously, you can see here it was listed 570. It was listed under market to generate a bidding war. They succeeded. Sold for $883 per square foot, parking included. Okay, there's the layout there. Unit 712, also a recent sale, uh, February 4th. Sold for 550000 Sold for exactly asking price. It's 586 square foot, one plus 10, parking in. Uh, $938 per square foot. So get to Pinnacle East prices in just a second. Um, marketed occupancy is September of 2023. It's two towers, 30 stories, just under 800 units in total. It has retail on the ground level and is built by Pinnacle. Important to know that it's built by Pinnacle. If you recall earlier, I said every builder, pretty much every builder in the city needs construction financing. 
uh, Pinnacle does not. Pinnacle is one of the only two builders in the entire city that does not ask you for a mortgage pre-approval when you buy a pre-construction. Why? Because they're so financially secure. They've never canceled a project. They don't need uh, the bank's approval to go ahead and build. Like I said, they're the guys behind Sky Tower, great developer to work with. Um, never had any client say anything bad about, you know, after they close on the Pinnacle unit. Amenities, you have everything uh, a tenant could ever need, outdoor swimming and hot tub. Um, thank God it's it's just the one pool. Um, a lot of, uh, seeing a lot of buildings that are like 300 units or so having a pool, obviously that's a disaster for maintenance fees. You have 800 units here sharing the cost of an outdoor pool, which is less than an indoor pool. So that's nice. Outdoor terrace and barbecue, gym, yoga studio, all the usual dining party room. I'm not going to bore you with that because again, as an investor, uh, amenities should be an afterthought. Your focus should be on, on value. Where does it line up and what does the cash flow and ROI look like? Maintenance fees, 57, 54 cents per square foot. One parking is included with every unit. It's only 10% down before occupancy, uh, which is nice because the marketing occupancy of September 2023, in all reality, I like to tell people, you know, even Pinnacle, um, they push this back because they, they've just finally got the zoning, so they're ready to go. Um, anticipate for 2024. And as an investor, to be honest, I'd rather have the larger spread. So it's realistically a four-year timeline from now. Uh, so only 10% down, which means you're leveraged in the market 10 to 1 for the next four years. Okay. One of my favorite units here. Like I said, we don't have a whole ton of these. Um, that 10% down deal is, is, is an exclusive deal with us in Pinnacle. Um, there's not a whole ton of two bedrooms that they're going to allow that to be offered on. Uh, this is one here, Residence 29. 879 square feet, two bed, two bath, one parking included. Uh, on the 12th floor, 699,000, which works out to less than $800 per square foot. If you recall, Atria selling their two beds at 883 per square foot, and these are resale, right? Um, so rather than being 30% above market, you're buying a few, you know, 5% below market, which is incredibly rare for pre-construction. It's the only project uh, of that's like this under market this year. Anyways, uh, on the 13th is a thousand dollars more, uh, great layout, great split layout, uh, windows in both masters. Uh, I won't bore you guys too much with the floor plans. Like I said, I'm going to send all of this to you via email. Uh, the next one is residence 27. This one's 895 square foot, two bed, two bath, one parking, 11th floor, 708 works out to 792 per square foot. And this is just a sample cash flow on the residence 29. Um, so your down payment is 139,980. In reality, it's actually only 69,900 for the next four years. And then it's another 69,900 uh, four years from now. Current rental rate, we took an incredibly conservative 2450. Again, if you remember, Atria is renting at well over three bucks a foot, but uh, COVID and, and just, I like to be really conservative in these cash flows because otherwise they can, uh, you know, I'd rather under promise and over deliver. So assuming um, a 3% rental inflation year over year, you're looking at rent in 2024 of 2750. Your expenses work out to just over 2750. Uh, so your net cash flow is negative nine bucks a month. Again, 3% rental inflation is conservative. And this number here uh, is also conservative. So it can likely work out better than that, but let's say worst case scenario, you break even, that's pretty great for any pre-construction in, in the GTA right now. There's not many projects that can say that. Your principal reca recapture on a monthly basis at 1.7% is just over 1200. So your actual monthly, you call it net worth increase, uh, 1194. And then what we use for, pre people always ask me, you know, what's my condo gonna be worth? Um, it's a question I hate, hate answering, if I'm honest with you guys. Um, because obviously I don't have a crystal ball. And if I could tell you exactly what a unit would be worth in 10 years, I'd probably, you know, be a trillionaire and I don't know if I'd be selling condos. Um, but that said the 10 year average for appreciation in Toronto, uh, for condos only is 7.9%. That's incredible. And we've had a really good 10 years, right? Except for 2012 here, you can see, um, I like to use the 45 year average. Okay, which is 6.1% because the 45 year average rolls in a number of crashes. Um, so the 45 year average kind of prices in downside. 
Um, so if you take 6% and you apply it, this is what the condo value looks like over time. Hope you guys can see that. Again, we'll email everything. Um, didn't add the principal recapture here. Probably should have. It makes the numbers look a little bit better. But you get the gist. You get the idea. Um, that's kind of what it looks like over a long period of time. Um, and yeah, so this is, um, like I said, 8%. We use our uh, incredibly conservative numbers in our cash flow. So um, hope that presentation helps. I will send you guys everything via email and let's get into some Q&A. Okay. What? Okay, a couple things here. Uh, what do you think about the Grand Central Mimico project in Etobicoke? The area is pretty shady as of now. Okay. Uh, I don't think you mean like shady as in terms of sun. I'm assuming you actually mean um, sketchy. Uh, I don't know if I would call Royal York near San Remo a sketchy neighborhood. Maybe it's just me. Um, I like the project a lot. Uh, we're going to be selling it because... That's a Van Dyke project right on the go. It's the only development um, ever in the Toronto of history that has a direct partnership with Metrolinx. So, so Metrolinx and Van Dyke are partnered on that site. So in terms of transit, it literally couldn't get any better. Your building is actually connected to the GO station. Um, also, I, our offices are near that area that you call shady. Uh, I really like the neighborhood and um, I think uh, there's a ton of downsizers and empty nesters in that neighborhood. There's a lot of value to bringing a condo project there because there obviously isn't one. Um, I like the project a lot. It'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see where prices line up. Uh, eight Wellesley, a good investment in the long term. Yeah, I mean, how many sites are on Young, right? Um, the land is pretty much all developed, so there's not a whole lot of opportunity for future development. Um, so it's sort of one of a kind. Uh, I think uh, pricing is coming in somewhere around 1400 a foot on average, which uh, is in line with Concord's um, rebrand of Crestford's uh, Crestford site. So um, over a long, like, you know, resale in the neighborhood is only 1100 a foot, you're paying 1400 a foot. So you're paying about a $300 a foot premium. But if you're talking, you know, when you're saying long term here, I'm assuming you're talking a 15, 20 year time horizon, it's going to be a good investment. Thoughts on Galleria on the Park. Are you premium or platinum for Galleria on the Park? Yeah, yeah, we work very closely with PSR uh, and ELAD and we sold a number of units there. Um, I like the project. Galleria is an awesome project. It's, it's what's really unique about Galleria is it's bringing more, it's bringing the same amount of um, uh, retail as it's actually getting rid of. So, that, so believe it or not, on a square footage basis, it's actually bringing the same amount of retail back. So what's nice about master plan communities is they can do stuff like that, where they have a lot of unique tenants. They have more value add than just a single build. Um, it's, you know, 1200 a foot or so. So it's a little expensive, but it's, it's the amount of development coming along DuPont over the next decade is immense. Now that we don't have a development freeze on the north side of DuPont, um, it's one of the first, but it's certainly not the last. How's eight Wellesley compared to 11 Yorkville? Obviously, I mean, slightly different locations here. Jack is a good location slash good investment. Um, yeah, um, it is a good location, good investment. Again, it's above market. Um, what projects in Etobicoke have great potential value? Um, Mirabella. So Mirabella still has units left at $1,000 per square foot. It's right at Windermere and Lakeshore. Um, meanwhile, resale is selling for a thousand bucks a foot, right? So Mirabella has some pretty good value because you're paying fair market, which in most cases you're paying far more than that. Opinion on Madame's Vita buildings in Etobicoke, big fan of the area. Uh, love the area too. I live right next door. Um, Vita is awesome. So we sold, we have a lot of clients in Vita. Um, I like the boutique building Vita too, a little bit better. I just, you know, I have a, a thing for boutique buildings. I think they're more livable over the long term, less ele elevator issues. You have far less um, renters, you tend to have far more owners. It's of course more expensive than Vita, uh, but it's good. One Jarvis Hamilton, it's gonna be, it's gonna be depend. My opinion on that is going to depend on where prices sort of line up, but based on early estimates at 800 bucks a foot after, after getting parking. Um, I mean, I grew up in Hamilton. 
Uh, Hamilton's come a long way. It's going to continue. There's a ton of redevelopment coming to Hamilton. Again, it's going to be above market. So any of these projects you guys are asking me about, if it's above market by 20%, that doesn't inherently make it a bad investment. It makes it slightly speculative. And all it means is you need longer time horizons. So when you're talking about projects like eight Wellesley and one Jarvis, they will make you money if you hold them for 10 years. Just don't buy them expecting to reassign them in three years at profit, because that simply won't happen when you're already paying a 20% spread over resale. For resale, do you see any value at EDS, larger two better? Are they starting to uptick in price? Uh, there's still there's still actually a, a lot of listings there. There's still good value there. If the site is being developed as a master plan like Galleria, don't you run the risk where your unit completes with thousands of other units in the same master plan community? Um, yes. I don't know if I'd necessarily call it a risk. Um, I'm, I'm guessing the question is coming from a place of if you're investing in it, are you going to have to rent well the same at the same time as you know hun hundreds of other investors are going to have to rent? Nice thing about Galleria and most master plan communities is the delivery of the condos are spaced out, so it's not as though all eight towers are going to deliver at the same time. You have time, um, and that's just. Um, when you buy an investor heavy building, that's just the assumption that you're going to have to make is that there's going to be 51 bedrooms that lease on, at the time of interim occupancy. And you have to make, you know, a choice as to, uh, usually you have to accept less than market rent just to get someone in. Um, that obviously doesn't mean sacrificing on tenant quality. That's the most important thing in my opinion. Uh, and that's why like we have a, uh, two property managers in house and that's our most important kind of metric is, is tenant quality. Um, I don't know if I'd so much call it a risk. It depends on if you're intending to immediately sell right on closing. Pinnacle in Etobicoke and its impact on KIP as they are both next to each other. Well, Pinnacle's a lot nicer. So Cypress is a lot nicer than KIP, right? Instead of eight, six ceilings, you have nine smooth. Uh, instead of carpet in the bedrooms, you have limited throughout. Um, KIP was uh, priced really aggressively. So you kind of got what you paid for in that pocket. Um, as far as their impact on each other, um, I think Cypress will always hold higher value than KIP just because of the quality of the units. Um, but like Pinnacle Etobicoke, I don't know if you know this, Pinnacle Etobicoke, Cypress is the first phase of eight towers there. So there's a lot more coming. The lack of new construction starts for 2019 and 2020 and the ratio of home to condo prices, do you think those factors are enough to say that condos will appreciate a higher rate over the next few years than townhomes are detached? Do you think that the returns will be similar. I think condos are going to appreciate home. I would appreciate homes and detached for the next couple of years. Absolutely, they have to in order to close that gap, where the gap just stays at that. About at that, it's the there's a market dislocation right now. Condos are the superior value. The only thing holding people back is the question of how long, how much longer is COVID going to impact work from home and and rental prices. Um, I think uh, you know, as humans, we're naturally pessimistic. And we're already starting to see the return to normal. We're starting to see it. I mean, I don't know if you drive on the Gardner, but it's starting to get busy again. Um, and uh, we're actually seeing employment gains in the $30 an hour and plus sector. So while the entry level wages are depressed, we're starting to see uh, more employment in the higher wage sector. And so um, I think that gap is going to probably start closing this year. I would bet this year is, a, is sort of a, a big year for condo appreciation. Do you think the long-term rental market will stay strong in downtown, even with the outflow of people to the suburbs due to the pandemic? Uh, long-term, yeah, I think it's going to bounce back to normal. I don't know about you guys, but I'm not trying to spend my weekends at Kelsey's. Um, I do think, uh, again, people are naturally pessimistic. They think things are here to stay. You know, there were people who during 9-11 said they'd never fly again. And of course, those people are flying again. So, um, you know, McKinsey did a, on a more less anecdotal and more scientific uh, note, McKinsey did a study of uh, 800 executives and found that the vast majority of them don't see any contraction in their office space requirements over the next five years. So that's a very interesting telltale to me that says the executives actually driving the decisions of should they kill their office rents are not doing so. You know, Shopify leased some space recently. Amazon increased their space requirements. Google leased some more space in Toronto recently. And this is all during COVID. Um, so that's all very interesting to me. Uh, do you think Toronto's affordable housing zoning policy impacts market prices in the long run? I assume you're talking about the fact that developers have to start budgeting for including affordable housing. 
or, or cash in lieu, um, it'll just affect the end price of pre-construction units. Do you think buying a studio unit is a bad idea in any pre-construction project going forward, um, given that it has the highest price, price per square foot and the change preference impacted by COVID? I would be a buyer of a studio on the resale market right now because there's a lot of really good deals. Um, but you're right. The problem with pre-construction studios is the price per square foot is, is, is incredibly high. And that's not to say that the price per square foot for studios isn't higher on the resale market than one beds, because of course it is. Um, it's just a function of affordability. And that's also why pockets like Regent Park out appreciated pockets like Yorkville. And that's why Shepherd and Warden is going to out appreciate Yorkville is entirely because of affordability. When, you know, people only make so much money and as condos continue to appreciate, you start to see money flow to the outer pockets, wherever you can get the best deal in terms of price per square foot. So you tend to see a higher, you know, um, more appreciation in those pockets on a, on a, on a percentage basis. Um, I think it depends on the studio and the project in particular um, and, and how elevated that price per square foot is versus their other units in the building. It's hard to find, based on the price list I'm seeing right now, it's really difficult to justify the price per foot on a lot of these studios. They're pretty astronomical. Um, yeah, that's kind of what I think about that. What project do you not like or prefer to stay away from? I can't answer that on a live video where I don't know how many developers or other agents are watching. Concord's Canada House compared to the well, both will be developed around the same, delivered around the same time. The well offers building of rental apartments. Would that affect the rental in the area? So, yeah, so the well has two rental buildings, uh, three actually, two signatures, and then one taller building. Um, will it affect the rental? Well, you'll be competing with Dell, Pro uh, Dell Property Management for tenants. They tend to charge more than market. Um, I'm not overly concerned because again, whether you look at build or, or there's, we're running at a deficit of about 20,000 apartments a year in Toronto under current immigration and, and completion rate. Um, so I wouldn't be necessarily concerned about there being a rental building right next to me. Uh, it's kind of, it's going to have, usually when you have a rental building right next to you, it's, it was built in the seventies. And so it's not exactly a direct comparison to your condo rental because there are two very different rental rates and for two different types of clientele. Um, in this case, they're going to be very similar because they're obviously tried out. Uh, they're both uh, developed by tried out. Um, but I wouldn't let it hold me back from investing in the well just because I think that particular project has huge interest. And I think once it's complete with the immense amount of retail, both boutique at shopping and the um, uh, all the food options, like six five star restaurant, like it's just it's one of those pockets that a lot of people are really going to want to live there. It's like the Yorkville of the entertainment district. So I think uh, I, I, I think the benefits kind of outweigh the risks in that regard. Canada House is, you know, Canada House might not have rentals. I like I like a lot about Canada House, um, but you know, Canada House had a lot of smaller units that were purchased by investors. So it's not like you're not going to have your own rental competition in your building. Why do you like One Young? It's very expensive. Um, not, I, I actually disagree. So the reason is because condos in Toronto are priced on a per square foot basis, right? Um, so it's easy to look at a, you know, 700 square foot, 690 square foot, one plus den at a million dollars and say, you know, holy crap, that's, that's way more than a one plus den at Harbor Plaza. But it's like Harbor Plaza's one plus dens are 525 square feet. Um, when you look at the actual price per square foot at one yen, you can get under, you can get in under 1400 per foot at a hotel residence mix directly connected to the path with high end finishes and a hotel bar in your lobby and hotel amenities in the building and the second tallest residential tower in Canada, if one blur gets their height extension um, for 1400 a foot, or you can go buy at your average cookie cutter um, pre-construction condo investment anywhere else downtown at 1400 a foot. So the values are kind of in line, but you're getting a lot more for your money at one young. Also one great thing about one young is 95 stories. That thing is going to take six, seven, eight years to complete. So that's a lot of time leveraged in the market that I don't have to close on a unit, that I don't have to rent my unit, I don't have to assume a mortgage, and um, my unit's just appreciating. That's a, that's a lot of spread, uh, and spread's great. Can you send a link to the entire presentation, including Q&A? Absolutely. Is there any new projects coming on Long Branch Area, Etobicoke? Yep, a whole ton. Um, sign up to any Etobicoke project on our website, precondo.ca. 
because we are going to be sending out an update email that shows every development coming to the neighborhood over the next decade. Um, that'll really give you some context on the sheer amount of construction coming to the area. Are we going to see more new condo launches in Toronto in 2021? Absolutely. It's going to be a big year for launches. A lot of people held off last year. LRT is a big value add to Notting Hill. Absolutely. And there are some, there are some really good prices at Notting Hill, depending on, depends on the unit, but there are some, some really good value units. What would you recommend in Scarborough? Pinnacle East. Uh, although, I mean, it's right on the border of North York and Scarborough, but Pinnacle East. Would you be able to speak to the difference in returns on a five to seven year timeline if someone was to invest in pre-construction versus an existing unit? Right now, outside of the core, is it just a matter of the amount of money you have to put down and not having to get a mortgage right away? Yeah, and it also depends on value. So, like, you know, if you can find a pre-construction unit that happens to actually be five percent below market, you're going to do better than obviously buy something on the market because you're paying market. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is it depends on how old the building that you're buying into is, um, because with the exception of boutiques, unique lofts, and that kind of thing, um, newer buildings do tend to have slightly higher price per foot on the, on the sales market. Condos are, you know, they're not freehold. Um, there's maintenance fees to worry about and age is a, is a, is a factor. Keeley. Keeley is a good project. I'm assuming you already have one. For uh, yeah, you can email me about Keeley. Keeley, sorry. Westerly does have some units left, although I think they increased their prices today. I will have to double check on that. Don't hold me to that. But um, yeah, Westerly was an amazing value deal at $900 per square foot right on Islington Station last year. And for whatever reason, they struggled to sell. Um, but uh, in the last like two weeks, they've just moved an, an immense amount of their, their inventory. And obviously, Tridel is a reputable builder. Your thoughts on buying a condo on assignment? Yeah, you, you be careful what realtor you use. Um, just just make sure you know all the risks of it. It depends on how you structure the deal. Um, obviously, they can be cash intensive. So a lot of so some assignment sellers are going to want both their deposit on the initial purchase price plus their profit up front. Others, many of them, uh, especially right now because there's so many assignments on the market, will be willing to take their profit on final close, which means you can actually get get it financed, provided you go with a good mortgage broker and a good bank, which is nice because then you're only doing 20% down. Um, you just wanna make sure if you're buying an assignment during the time of interim occupancy, that that unit has not been occupied, absolutely has not been occupied. Pre-construction condo or pre-construction detached condo. Okay. All right, guys. Um, I'm going to send you, you all the, the, an email with, um, we'll, we'll send out this link once this is uploaded to YouTube in case you want to rewatch anything. If you have any questions, you can email me anytime. Uh, Jordan at Precondo SA. Good call. Thank you to be. I will plug my YouTube. Um, and uh, we'll email the Pinnacle East units. Like I said, I only have four of them. Uh, first come, first serve. If you have any questions about them, um, just let me know and I'll send over some more details uh, as well. Sorry, one sec here. YouTube's here, market updates every Sunday and um, yeah, lots of other stuff we talk about on YouTube as well. Thank you guys for coming. I know uh, talking about real estate isn't exactly the most exciting thing, but uh, so shocked with the turnout. Wasn't expecting that many people. Okay. Uh, all right. Take care. Have a good evening, guys.